What's your position at Commonwealth? Head of compliance and MLRO. Head of compliance and MLRO. You have big people in the room. <laughs> Gladys sent you here, right? Yes, no. Do you report to Gladys? No. No? Yeah, because you have a report directly to the board. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Me and you said we'll be working together soon. We're going to get started. If you got any latecomers, that's their problem. We get started. So this is a class of taxation, right? Principles of taxation. When I was the minister, I, I designed this class for Jeffs. Um, morning. What's your name? Javon Pratt. Javon Pratt. Yes, please. Where are you from? your position at Delta? Credit officer. Credit officer. You're spending the money. When did you start there? After I left. Taxation, like I said, I helped design this course when I was the minister. We designed a couple courses for this. And we designed it because the country was clearly moving both from a domestic point of view and international financial services into an area where taxation is becoming relevant. Uh, we saw the introduction of VAT, we saw all these uh, transparency and automatic exchange and different initiatives internationally. And so the, 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 the basis of this was to try to get a taxation course that gave you a context of what tax policy is and how a country approaches tax policy. And then we dive down into some of the nitty gritty of taxation. I think we have taxation and trusts in this course, right? We have international tax, um, which is a very significant and relevant area. Um, I think you have a module on that, right? And the like. So I teach. I teach the, the fundamentals of tax policy, which is a two-class mo module, um, goes down to kind of the basis of tax policy and how you formulate tax policy, how it should be implemented from a national point of view and from a country point of view. And I also teach the international tax module, which is a very, very meaty, hefty part of the course. Um, I'll be rewriting that module in part. Um, for our classes because of the new EU initiatives and the blacklisting and the new legislation that is coming out um, to address that. Um, I work with, closely with the government helping to draft that legislation and put it together. So all of the new pieces of legislation I helped draft um, and I had input in. So um, we will modify that international, uh, which only deals with you know, automatic exchange, TIAs, FATCA, CRS, we will now address the EU initiatives, the multinational enterprises legislation that was just passed, uh, substance, economic substance legislation that's been released, um, ring fencing issues, which has also been released, and beneficial ownership registry, which is a new piece of legislation that's happened. So we'll, I'll incorporate those new pieces of legislation that's happened in the last year into that module, which will probably make it even more meaty and hefty. Um, so like I said, this course, this, this, this module, the first one, can never get this one okay. again. Right in here. So this, this class, yeah, if you can, you know, like, I don't know more to I don't know if you to break things around. So, it's in the book, good. Oh, it's on my computer, okay. 
So the basis of this module, like I said, is the introduction of tax policy when a country is looking to implement new taxation. And certainly in recent years, it's now pretty old hat when we introduced that, which is a new form of taxation and consumption tax. And, and you'll see me referring to in how VAT was implemented and its effect on what the principles of good taxation are, um, both from a, putting it into effect and from administering it, because you have to administer a tax policy, as we, as we know from our collection man from the gaming board, you know, and then we talk next, next, next class about enforcement, which I think he's going to be, you know, all gung-ho about, right? I can tell you who my clients are, and you can, you know, come to an agreement. So, um, so Adam Smith is, you know, I think he was from the 1700s, but he, he gave, hello, good morning. morning, how are you? Good, I'm going to leave this with you. What's your name? Yvette Barr. Yvette Barr, where do you work, Ms. Barr? Scotia Wealth. Scotia Wealth, we got two Scotia Wealth. Yeah. That's yeah. good, that must mean you all have a lot of clients, and you all are doing very well. Scotia is also one of our clients. Got all our clients and then the enforcement people in there. It's going to be good. So Adam Smith is from the 1700s. He first was kind of the philosopher of taxation, right? And this is a this is a very um, you know kind of all inclusive summary of taxation. So it says the subjects, which are us, of every state ought to contribute towards the support of their government. We we should financially support our government as near as possible to the proportion of their respective abilities, right? That is, in proportion to the revenue which they respectively enjoy under the protection of the state. So what they're saying is you should contribute in proportion to your income and what your expectations are from the state. Um, you know, the poor should proportionally contribute less than the rich. You know, that's kind of his philosophy. Does that really happen? We'll talk about that, especially in the Bahamas. The expense of the government to the individuals of a, of a nation is like the expense of management of a great estate, right? So what they're saying is you have to finance the management of the state and you should find, and, and the management really should be efficient, but we'll talk about that as well and if there's any waste. Um, and so this is, kind, this is kind of the philosophy of proportionality of taxation. Now we have the OECD term chiming in, and we know that is the evil empire in Paris, right? That's about to destroy the Bahamas, right? But they're, 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 they're weighing in on what they think good tax policy is, right? And they take a more of an economic approach. And they say tax systems are designed cl and as closely linked to domestic and international investment decisions. So they say tax policy is based on investment decisions. It has to be fair. Right? It has to be transparent so you have an expectation, but it should also have a material effect on investment decisions. You know, a tax system proposes inclusiveness, encourages good governance, and matches the society's views with the income and wealth inequalities that exist. So it brings a little bit of redistribution in there and investment decisions. That's kind of OECD's approach. OECD always takes kind of more economic approach to these things. Right? And so what are the general principles? Adam Smith said there's four maxims of taxation. And this is kind of a, a famous kind of you know, position. He says the four maxims of taxation is proportionality, convenience, transparency, and efficiency. Right? Meaning everybody is, is, is taxed in proportion to their income. We saw that in the first slide, right? It's got to be convenient, transparent, and efficient to administer. And then you have a good tax policy as a country. Um, you know, certainly we may not achieve this in the Bahamas, um, and I think many countries have a difficult time achieving this, because tax isn't easy. Tax is very complex, and tax is very, um, you know, kind of in-depth, and when you find somebody cheating the system one way, you try to put new tax laws in to fix it, and they go in this way, and you put, and so what happens is you have this discombobulated tax effect, you know, the uh, Internal Revenue Code is about that long with its regulation. It's huge. How are you possibly supposed to, I mean, is that convenient or efficient? No. Right? And so then we have our almighty father to the north across the Great Pond in London speaking about what tax policy then. 
and they similar, right? Tax should fall, what should aim to achieve to the legislative framework for tax its administration and complexity. So it brings in complexity and administration into their kind of analysis of what it is. Now, my, my personal belief, I think, one, you have, it has, tax has to be predictable, but also I'm more on the kind of, even though they're the evil empire in Paris, on the OECD side, where I think taxation has a significant impact on economic decisions and the, ec and the economic growth of the country and whether people want to invest in your business with it. And taxation has a material effect on that. When I counsel my clients all the time, they want to talk about tax. They want to talk about uncertainty and tax. They want to know what the Bahamas is doing now because nobody knows because of all these different things. And then it's uncertain. You have you know, a negative influence on the economy of your country. So a tax structure which is structured to promote growth will not succeed if businesses are faced with constant change, right? or the inefficiency of collection. So I use always an example of this. What happens every year in the Bahamas around June through July 1st? The budget, right? And we saw it this year. We see it every year, right? What happens? Game and board people know. Everybody's sitting there looking good, smiling until they table the legislation. And you get all these tax. And so you can't plan your business year to year because you know come June, you're on your tippy toes waiting for something to drop, right? The gaming houses didn't know what was going to happen until what happened? Boom! Deputy Prime Minister threw the bill on the table. Now they're going to go sue them, right? But why are they doing that? They're doing that because of constant change. You hear from the auto dealers all the time in the Bahamas. Every year the duty of change is on vehicles. You think they go and speak to, to the auto dealers about it? No. Come, you know, was it second week in June or whatever? Bam! Something changed. Right? I'm sitting there with a full inventory of cars. Uh, you heard Ben Aubrey say this. Sitting there with a full inventory of cars, what happens? You just drop the duty 20% on new cars. How am I going to sell my old cars on the lot that I brought in at 65% when now you're going to bring them in at 45%? People are either going to go to the states and get them now, or I got to take a loss on all these cars on my lots to get it off. Constant change. They struggle. Right thing to do is let's talk about this. This is what we want to do. Come a month before so they can get rid of their inventory before July 1st. Then you get predictability. You can have economic growth. Right? Taxes can reduce growth. Right? Even if they're stable, clearly targeted. And efficiently collected, right? And where a system contains incentives to distort economic growth. So you can have the predictability of a tax system, but it has such an overbearing effect on one of your segments that it, it does not promote growth. Even if they would have told the numbers guys what they wanted to do, right? With all these taxes. It is a disproportionate tax on one segment, and it's going to distort the growth of the numbers business. Even, you know, what's your name? Anya. Anya? Anya Charles, yes. Anya Charles. Where do you work, Ms. Charles? Winterbotham. Winterbotham. What do you do at Winterbotham? Compliance officer. Compliance officer. Boy, we got all kinds of big people in here today. <laughs> be, be, be careful. <laughs> So that's an example where even if the government took the approach, we're going to be transparent, we're going to be consultative, and we're going to be predictable with you guys, we're going to talk this through three months before the budget, bam! They're still going to affect their growth because they, they, they tax in all their money. How can you do that? Right? So then Sebastian and I'm going to go hire all these lawyers. You can hire Graham Thompson, you see that, right? <laughs> Game and board should hire us then. Right? And so that distorts the economic growth of that industry, even if they were transparent, the whole disproportionate tax effect. Now, on the opposite, tax policy can, can, can promote the growth of, the, uh, of economic sectors. Right? So we have legislation that does that in the Bahamas. Can you give me an example of a piece of legislation that that promotes growth in a sector, that gives a preference for that sector. A 
Hotel Encouragement Act, right? What does the Hotel Encouragement Act do? You are a licensed hotel, you're a new construction hotel, or you're doing significant uh, capital um, improvements, you get tax concessions. You get import duty concessions and real property tax concessions. So that's a tax policy of the Bahamas designed to incentivize the growth of an industry. The Industries Encouragement Act sets similar concessions for manufacturers, right? To help promote manufacturing in the country and small business and small industry. You even have it for special zones. Downtown Improvement Act right? gives you duty-free concessions for capital improvements to your buildings and structures downtown. Well, that ain't worked too well, did it? But it's it's tax policy to try to promote economic growth. We see one we see a proposal now, right? The Over the Hill Initiative. Right? We'll see if that works. So it has to, has to have a balance between being fair and promotion of growth, right? Without a lot of anomalies. And our budget system just creates anomalies because it just creates unpredictability every year. There's something that has to, that, that comes about. As a taxpayer, individual taxpayers, what do you think is most important? proportionality and, and fairness, right? If you are a regulator or an enforcement man, we got one of them in the room. We always have one. Right? What's important to you from a, like in, in the context of your employment? Uh, I would say uh, constant and uh, efficiency. Very good. Very good. We'll talk about efficiency later. Especially in the context of administration, tax administration, it's very important to be efficient. I, I, I hope the gaming board, you know, is a beacon of efficiency um, that inland revenue can learn about. Sometimes I have inland revenue officers in this class. You know, I pick on them hard, hard. <laughs> that is a beacon of inefficiency in this country. I have big problems with, uh, with that. If you're a business owner, what's important to you? Fairness and predictability. I mean, you hear it from the car dealers again all the time, right? They just want to be a predictable, constant environment to do business. And they're, they're hurt bad because it's such a big thing to put vehicles in, and then when you can store it, you know, they have so much sunk cost. Right? So, again, when you are developing tax policy, right, there are three features that are especially important. If it affects incentives that may alter, not, alter economic behavior, right? And it's going to alter it in the good or the bad. This is where we talked about Hotel Encouragement Act, Industries Encouragement Act. Those are tax policies to help it in the good, right? And to try to influence investment and behavior in that industry. What's the 5% um, gaming tax to the patrons supposed to do? What's, the, what's, what's, what's that? That's to discourage people from going and, and playing, right? Because you lose 5% before you even pick your number. So that's a tax policy that's made, that's put there to discourage the behavior of consumers, right? The distribution, and this is your proportionality, you know, what's important to you as an individual. You want to know that your distribution Right across the population, right, is equitable or is fair. Right? You don't want one sector getting the benefits that another sector may deserve. You want it proportional to the needs of that sector, right? And that's the distribution of the taxation. So is is you know buying a sixty-five million dollar hotel using tax dollars, is that the proper distribution across a population? Or is that something geared to a small sector of the population in Freeport to help stimulate that growth, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and I think you've seen backlash of certain taxpayers, especially in Nassau. They say, what you mean, you just raised them a VAT? And now you can take all the money and buy this hotel and lose money just to save a couple jobs? I bet you go to Freeport, 
The opinion's probably different than that, right? Man, I can't wait till I, I, I used to have a job there, I get my job back, when, when they're gonna open, yeah, you could lose $20 million, it don't matter, I, I, I work it, right? So a, an opinion on effective tax policy depends on the proportionality of how your, the revenue is recirculated. Right? And to our enforcement people in the room, the enforceability of tax rules, right? And, com and, and, and compliance with tax rules. If it's hard to enforce or hard to comply, it's an ineffective tax system off the bat, right? And so I think the OEC is actually pretty, pretty dead on with this, this statement. On what is an effective tax policy? Right? And so we see that we talked about this just now. How is it? How are these policies effective in the Bahamas? I mean, you know, so we, you know, we live in these realms of tax policy. You know, we think that oh, we we don't pay no tax, we don't pay no income tax. You know, tax is simple here. But you see that tax decisions, even in a small country that doesn't have a sophisticated income tax regime, clearly affects both the effectiveness of tax, what people think about the tax, right? Oh, this is, this is like, I thought I had already had this play out. This is my economic philosophy slide, and this is where I sit personally. I sit squarely on this slide. Right? I'm all about economic growth. Because what they don't realize, right? Tax policy people in general. You heard it when they increased that to 12%. You know, they said, well, we go from 7.5% to 12%, we're going to get $400 million more tax revenue. Well, that's not true. Because I have less money to spend, you've got less money to spend. There was a business, a client of mine, a domestic business, a hair salon, right? a chain of hair salons in that zone. And in June, the minute they announced the increase in VAT, they hadn't increased it yet. Remember, July had increased. They lost 30% of their revenue in June compared to last year. And that's not even a direct effect. That's a, that's a perceived effect. So tax policy needs to be structured to promote growth. And just because you do one thing doesn't mean you're going to get the revenue. Spending $400 million off of, off of a 67% increase in, in value. They may get $200 million. People ain't going to spend. Now, I eat home most, in the, most of the week. Not, because why? I got to pay 15 plus 12. You know what that is to pay 27%? And they want to charge me $6 for a beer? Plus 27%? I might as well go make me one stiff drink at home. <laughs> you know? So that, that, that tax policy does not promote growth. My, pos my position is if you have tax policy to promote growth, economic growth is going to result in the additional revenue. You can't tax yourself out of a recession. Right? You can't you can't tax yourself into out of a deficit. You have to grow yourself out of a deficit. My philosophy. Other people clearly have different philosophies. Growth, to promote growth, you need the stability, you need the predictability, and you need incentives for the growth. Right? Taxes can reduce growth. We just we just talked about that with the, the, the five percent numbers tax on the patron. Even if they're tar efficiently connected and targeted, right? This can be easy to collect. Even more going to be easy to collect this. Because i got to take your 5% before you even spend your first dollar. And I, the gaming house, got to give it to them. That's going to be easy to collect. So all they got to do is go in and see the play. You played $100 million with my 5%. Easy. But it's going to affect growth in the sector. So you need both fairness and you need growth in order to have an effective tax policy that's going to have a proper effect on the country. Right? So they line these concepts in 
basic tax set, tax policy and procedural tax policy, right? Our game and board people would like the procedural tax policy because he's an enforcement agent, right? Generally, consumers want to follow the basic tax policies because it makes them feel, one, more comfortable in the tax system, and two, the idea of making more money. It promotes growth and competition, right? So it draws a balance. You have basic and procedural policies. So fairness, we talked about this. Tax should be fair. This is what you proportion, right? In proportion to what I give, into proportion to what I make, right? And there's an argument about on, on this with that. You heard it. I mean, I was in Parliament. I was, I was, I was in the cabinet to put that in the first time, right? So you all can take a look at me, too. <laughs> and and you, you heard the arguments, right? You heard Greg Moss up there. He didn't support that. He left the PLB over that, right? <laughs> You imagine that? <laughs> well, he said, this isn't fair. This isn't fair. Because the poor people are spending a greater percentage of their income on tax than the rich. Because it's a consumption tax, and everybody needs to consume a certain amount just to live. And the poor spend a greater percentage of their income on living than the rich. And so his point was that is not fair, because the poor are, are taking a bigger tax burden, right? Now my good friend Michael Altinas, who was the Minister of State for Finance at the time, said that's hogwash, because the rich spend more. And so the rich are actually paying more, because they spend more. And so it is proportionate, but it's proportionate on spending, right? And so those are two arguments that both make sense regarding the fairness of a tax policy right, that we put in. Now, whose argument do you support? Yeah, whose argument do you support? Commonwealth Bank, right? <laughs> Probably Moss. <laughs> right? Probably Moss. What about Winterbottom? Who's arguing you support? <laughs> Moss! Boy, why are you all didn't vote for his party? Uh -uh. <laughs> <laughs> um, now I know, I, know, I know Scotia. Scotia well. Who you all support? Huh? <laughs> so you all think that is, that is unfair? That's what you're saying? Because you, you, you buy the argument of proportionality of income versus how much I spend. Yeah, that's fair. You want income tax? Yeah. Maybe more fair. So, so would you think business license? Is business license fair? Right? If I'm Rupert Roberts, right? Wait, Rupert got one. Rupert? We got one. Serious, serious lobby boy. You got a serious lobby. I want, I want, I want Rupert as my flag. Rupert Roberts, right? He says, man, look, yeah, I got all, I got most turnover in the country. I got most turnover in the country, but I got a two percent profit margin. Right? So if I make if I make a hundred dollars revenue, right? That means I got two dollar profit. And what is it? Let's say it's one percent on turnover, right? You taking one dollar away from me on business license, I left with one dollar. Right? Where these bankers, right? These bankers, their margins are much bigger. Service providers' margins are always bigger because you don't have a lot of capital cost and in inventory, right? So my margin is, uh, it's even higher than 20% actually, but let's say 20%, right? I'm a, I'm a lawyer, let's pick on the lawyer since I'm the only one here. I make $100, right? I make $20 profit, 1% of turnover, $19 profit. Business license fair? Huh? Is it fair? <laughs> Wait, Rupert won't want income tax. Bad, boy! Bad! Because in income tax, 
If it's a 20%, 25% income tax, right? He paying 50 cents, right? Where it, whereby me, I pay five dollars instead of one dollar. You think that's fair? So business license risks losing legitimacy, and that's why you hear about a corporate income tax, right? Yes. Especially domestically, because Rupert wants it. Rupert gets what he wants. Mm -hmm. Gets what he wants. I remember, I remember when we first put that in place. Fifteen percent with all these exemptions, right? We thought it was bad. We had white paper and everything. We put Rupert gone mad. So I could go out of business because you've taken forty percent of my sales and making them exempt. But what that means is I can't reclaim input credits on the forty percent. Means I got to swallow the input credits. Cost goes up. I guess you're going to raise everything that's not valuable. I mean that that's valuable to compensate for the input credits I got to swallow. So what we do next? We well, take them exemptions away. Seven and a half percent. Rupert Roberts is a happy man. He gets all his credits. Right. So what happened again this time? The current government says bread basket, bread basket items as exempt. Rupert Roberts cry file again. It says 40% of my sales are breadbasket items. Same argument. What happened? He's zero rated now. Well, he get no, he in a refund position. They don't know the tax revenue they're gonna lose on that. He is now in a, almost a refund position because he gets zero rated on those sales. Which means he gets a refund on 40% of his credits. Not an offset, but a refund. Bad tax policy. Bad tax laws. But, but, they said that they were, that they were gonna make residential insurance exempt. Do you think they responded to the insurance lobby like they responded to Rupert Roberts? No, because it's still exempt. The insurance companies lose those credits. It'd be good, it'd be good to be Rupert Roberts, hey? <laughs> Boy. Another basic principle, again, you know my favorite one, a basic principle of taxation to support growth. So we want to be fair, and we want to support growth. And we've talked about this. All elements of a tax system can impact growth. The U.S. and their income taxes. The income tax is easy to provide tax incentives for growth. We understand how an income tax works, right? Again, I make $100. I have $20 in profit, right? But let's, let's, before we get there. How an income tax works. My revenues, $100, right? My cost of doing business, right? My expenses, I get to deduct from that. So let's say I get $80 of expenditure to make that $100. My net income is 20, right? Now, say I'm in the small business category of the US and I get a 10% or 5% tax credit. So this is a deduction, right? So the, and then let's say I'm on a 25% income tax rate, $5, right? And so let's say I get a tax credit of 2% of revenues. 2% of that, $2, right? A tax credit comes off the tax, not on the not off of the gross. So I get two dollars off my tax, which is tax credits are fantastic because it comes off the tax and come off the gross. Mm -hmm. That is an incentive that has an impact on growth because I'm paying three dollars of tax. So instead of twenty five percent, right, I'm paying fifteen percent net. Right, right, yeah, 15% of three dollars. So I've now, because of a because of the two uh, a two percent tax credit, reduced my tax rate by 10%, and I could take that money and put it back into my business for growth. And that's the theory on that, right? And that's how tax. And so when you have a corporate income tax system, you can do all kinds of stuff. You can give extra deductions, you can give tax credits, you can do all kinds of stuff in this calculation. 
that in theory is to support growth. Good day. Don't mind you. You don't want to learn tax? No, thank you. <laughs> what? When they start taxing you, you know, you know if it wasn't for the Attorney General, when you go play your number today, you were going to have to pay 5%. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to know about tax. <laughs> I, I didn't play the number, so I think I'm fine. <laughs> Yes, that's something. That's something, man. That is awesome. Minister of Tourism say, well, you can be gone, Meet you in court. <laughs> Give off. Meet you in court. <laughs> Within an hour, the Attorney General comes. Oh, we're going to postpone this. We're going to postpone this. <laughs> what happened to one voice? What happened to collective decisions? Anyway, I'm in a but you've got to be mindful of these effects on growth. You've got to be mindful that when you announce a 12% VAT out of left field, that businesses are going to have 30% less revenue that month. Just out of the fear. Now, if you did a study beforehand and you said, listen, this and that, and prepared the people, then maybe it wouldn't have an effect, right? Now, I had to put this in, the, in, in here, right? I, the promotion of economic growth is not the sole purpose of taxation and may not be the primary purpose of taxation. Right? The primary purpose is what? Get revenue for the government so they can go buy hotels. Right? And so we talked about some of the tax policies that can impede growth and support growth. Competition. Competition is good, right? Mm -hmm. Especially good for the consumer. It's supposed to drive down prices, give you more options. And tax policy can help that. And an efficient tax system, right? That's stable and, and competitive, promotes growth. When people are looking to invest in the, in the region, in the Caribbean, they could. They take tax studies of the different countries. They say, well, it's going to be my tax impact in Barbados. It's going to be my tax impact in Jamaica. It's going to be my tax impact in the Bahamas. And is it stable? If I make my, if I make my decision today, tomorrow am I going to be in a different position? Right? And they do these studies. And so to the extent you can be stable yet competitive, businesses look to your jurisdiction as a place to do business. You don't see no new cars dealers opening up, right? Because it ain't stable. Every year is a different tax rate. I mean, except for the ones on the on the street corner and stuff, right? And and, and uh, the, what was it? A few years ago, it was the Nigerians were here bringing in all kinds of cars, right? Except for them, right? But new car dealers, you don't see any growth in them. That's a hard business because it's not stable, and the tax rate's not competitive. Sixty-five percent on a car. One time it was 85 percent. Right? I remember. I remember when I was. Um, and, and stable doesn't mean rate. It can mean how you tax it. I remember when I was in opposition, right? And and and, and the prime minister was the right honourable. He was Ingram, right? Papa. But he came down one day in the budget. Same thing. He said, "We're not taxing cars on value." No more. We're taxing you on engine size. Remember this? Remember this was like 2011 or 12, right? I think it was 11. Right after I got into Parliament after the pilot. We, we, we're not taxing on value anymore. We're taxing on engine size. 1.4 liter and below gets 30% and everything else 70% or whatever it was. Well, you know what happened? You know what, what, what happened? Only one car imported by all the car dealers qualified the Ford Focus. One car. <laughs> car dealers looked at him like he was crazy. So not only is the tax rate should be stable, but the way you tax needs to be stable as well. Right? To support competition. 
I always love that example. Right? We said people do country studies. You can't have a tax rate that's so disproportionate to your neighbor who you're in competition with. Because the hotel is going to go there. Right? Casino tax. I know when we put the casino tax in that we benchmarked it to make sure that we were competitive in our rate. Everybody still don't like to pay it. But we're competitive in our tax rate for casinos when you look at the region. Right? They represent the big one down the road. Sorry. Um, so again, it's not as simple as tax rate, but how you tax, the method in which you tax. Right? That was a big change. Big change. We now threw the tax on the consumer on how much you would you spend. It was no longer only at the border, generally to the business people who had to pay up front. Right? So, now we have, so we had the basic principles, right? They're all how I make more money principles, right? Fair, competitive, stable, proportionate. For the enforcement in its side, I, I got to give Game and Board does do a lot better job than that. Right? On the enforcement side and the procedural side, you have to have something that's simple and easy to comply with. If I'm all over the place, I can tell you how much money and wastage there exists in how inland revenue procedurally, administratively, runs back. I've had to go and, 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 and threaten to sue them four times on behalf of clients. Had the writs prepared right there until I got them to, 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 to focus on they were doing it wrong. And in all instances, they reversed the assessments because they were doing it wrong. You know how much time, effort, and money is wasted because the administration is uncertain? I know what my gaming tax is. That's pretty straightforward. Right? This element is important, especially in regard to VAT. Right? There is a complete lack of confidence by businesses that the, 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 the VAT legislation is going to be interpreted consistently and properly. And I can tell you, because I, I represent plenty, plenty, plenty people in front of inline revenue. We got a big dispute going uh, now with the insurance industry. One of my clients, they threatened to sue him. They said, sue me. I said, okay. They said, sue me or tell them, get the deputy prime minister to tell me otherwise. <laughs> but, but it distorts economic activity. If it was easy, that's why when you Every time election season in the U.S., you hear flat tax, flat tax. Let's make tax system easy. Let's just do a flat tax. 13% of income, no deductions, right? That was what Steve Forbes said that, right? Way back in the day. Let's get rid of the internal revenue code that's this thick, right? That's uncertain, that I don't know how to apply. And let's say no, dedu no, no deductions, no special deductions, 13% of net income across the board. Why did we hang on to the duty system so long? We still do. It ain't complex. What's your value? 35%. Even the customs officer went less than 35%. Easy. 35%. 35%. No, 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 miss. Right here. Right here. 35%. Everything's 35%. But it's not complex. You've got a schedule, you've got a value. And boom, at the border, get your money up front. That's why for so long we've held, we've held on to these things. Business license, forget income tax, business license easy. What's your gross? What's your tax? No deductions, no offsets, no nothing. It's procedurally certain. Right? Stability, that's procedural principle, right? 
which direction is tax policy? We made the argument here over and over and over. Bahamas is completely unstable with respect to its tax system because it comes out of left field on the second week of June every single year. There's something, and it don't matter to the administration, that's inherent in the Bahamas. We are crazy tax people. Out of left field, let's just put the, and I, I get in the cabinet, what do we do? I said, don't you want to talk to these people about this? <laughs> what? Right? I mean, shouldn't you talk to them and tell them it's coming? No, 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 we'll just table it. <laughs> yes, we are the most unstable country in the world with our tax policy. Right? Because sudden changes should be avoided. Second week in June should be avoided every year for the Bahamas. We can just skip that week. <laughs> what is true? I mean, maybe you all have some insight. I, I got no insight. Not anymore. Twelve percent was out of left field. Mm -hmm. And then you had a week of speculation. Oh, yeah, they're going to just do twelve percent because they're going mm -hmm. down to ten percent. Right? They're going to make your bets and make you happy. Right? Yeah, it's just craziness. <laughs> June is the craziest month in the, in the country. It's unstable. It's unstable and it's definitely not predictable. Right? Definitely not predictable. But when you're doing business, these are the core principles of procedural effectiveness that allow me to do business for growth in the tax environment. And we have to be very careful with that. Especially with smaller businesses. Right? Business license. I'm a small business. I, I do my business license on my own. I submit and pay it, submit and pay it. Then out of left field, now I gotta go and get an accountant to sign off on this, an accountant to sign off on that. I don't make no money. You know, thousand dollars is a lot of money for me in a month of additional expense that I didn't plan on. Small businesses over that. And rightfully so, because you just came out of left field and told me how to do it. You said, next year we're going to ask you to get your business license and certify. This is the procedure. We have a list of, uh, of, of accountants we've negotiated a flat fee for, for small businesses under X amount of turnover. That's how you do it. Because it's predictable and you have time to prepare. Right? And so, you know, we always have this habit of, 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 of shocking people on tax. Right? Shocking them. So elements of a good tax system. And, and then ne next class on this, we can dive a little bit deeper on the administration element and, and how taxes are interpreted, um, how, how they come about you know, through consultation and judicial interpretation and the different aspects of legislation and, and the judiciary and, and the like. Um, and so that's an interesting class, especially for those who you know, those who like policy and stuff like that. Um, the fundamental elements. We've done a lot of these. Um, they're clear. Right? Tax administration. Now, like you said, the Indian Board does a pretty good job. Inland Revenue does not. Um, but the operation of how it's administered from a government point of view is fundamental to how effective a tax policy can be for a country. It right? has to be efficient and it has to be effective on the collection side. Some duties are so good. Payment board is good. You don't pay your you don't pay your your, your tax, they're gonna take your license away. You use an annual license. <laughs> you can't you can't get a license, you can't you can't do anything, right? Virtually every adult citizen interacts with his or her nation's tax administration. So you don't have to be a business. You bring stuff from the states all the time. You got to go and deal with your customs officer and this and that, and, and then and you got to get questioned if the invoice is right or not. You waste more time doing that. Every time you come through the airport. <laughs> oh, I got nothing to declare. <laughs> My tags off. Wrinkle them up a little bit. Get them secret, them secret up. Uh, zippers in the bottom of your bag. <laughs> stick a couple things in. And they got to dig through your bag. Every day you interact with your tax administrator. Right? 
and, and on both sides, you should be honest, right, at the airport, but they should be properly administering the tax policy. But if it's fair, you know, I, I give you an example. Now I go away, right, and I take my little, my little cooler bag with me empty, and I come back. I got salmon, shrimp, <laughs> scallop, right? I bring back a beef tenderloin so I can have fillets. I stack that cooler full. Busting up the seams. I have no problem. That's administration. Take everything I got. Duty free. Only got to pay back, mm -hmm. right? But I, I know that it's predictable. The revenue officer is very fair and efficient with it, and so it's no problem for me, right? If I had to bring meat and then they they think I steal it and doing stuff, then that's a problem. So if it if the perception that you're going to be okay in front of your administration is good. You got, you know, everything's fine. You know, I walk out, you're still happy because I go on home to do one steak and a little shrimp on the barbecue. And, right? So, but an administration unit does have responsibilities. See, I'm fine with that because I've been educated and informed that these items are duty free. But when everything's 35% when it ain't, right? Not only am I not being educated, they ain't being educated. Right? When, you, when, 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 when gaming board is auditing my client's returns on the game, gaming play, the submissions must be accurate and they must be able to process them efficiently. Right? From an administration point of view. Collect the taxes clearly. Provide assistance to taxpayers. Right? <laughs> yeah. That ain't happening in this round. <laughs> but it should. It should. Actually, it does happen to a bit. You know, one of the things that have been coming out uh, in recent years after every budget is the most commonly imported schedule, right? And it's like, what, seven or eight pages from customs, that most common item. So the consumer has education and has, is being assisted on what the rates are. That's been a big help because now I don't have to guess, right? I don't have to guess what it is. I just Google it and it comes up and... Separate. Oh, I thought you meant this going in this bag. No, this going in this bag. That's right. That's right. So what are the challenges on that? you got to tell me. What are the challenges of an administration unit? Right? Problem is when you when when you had no VAT, you had a simple form of administration. That's how the people in the agencies and administration units operated. You throw in this complex system of VAT, right? Complex, 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 and you haven't trained your administrators properly, and you just say, you're in the VAT unit. Of course they're going to be weak. And it affects the administration of the taxation regimes. Right? And it creates low taxpayer morale. You hear me, I, ro I, I roll and I run in land revenue all day, because I got a couple matters like that. And my clients have low morale. Right? Corruption, we can get into that, right? <laughs> And poor government, governance, they're often entrenched in a weak tax administration. Been there for years. I remember when, when, when I was in cabinet, my good friend, my dog, he would vex, 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 depending on the business license you make for this, business license you make for that. Remember when they moved all of them around? Took everybody out and moved them around? They had corruption and poor governance that he perceived to be in that unit, he moved them all out and put new people in. Now that created a weak tax administration unit because the people he moved in didn't know anything about business license. So you gotta be careful, you gotta be careful. 
and hard to tax sectors, right? What's a hard to tax sector? Cash business, right? Uh, dark shops. Pay that on your on your on your pump cell. You go into JVR. Well, you do. You go in. And they say you, you charge on credit card. No discount. You give me cash. Twenty percent. Now why do you think you get? Why do you think I get twenty percent if I pay cash? Twenty percent. I don't know what they do. <laughs> they do it. They do it some. I don't know what they do. When you go, I always use the, 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 the example with that, hard to tax sectors, right? Bigger establishments, easier to tax because they, you know, they're more institutional and you can walk in. You go to ROIT, right? You go down the road that goes to the port, right? You can turn left or you can turn right. Mm -hmm. I turn left, then I got the big businesses, the big conch shacks, so all of them were institutional. So I turn right. I got the smaller sky juice bar and right? I don't know that one. Anyway, I usually turn right. I like the sky juice better. Right? But but the smaller establishments are hard to tax. I come in and I pay in cash, they don't have these big, you know, buildings, right? And so they're hard to tax factors or challenges to tax administration. How am I gonna go audit them? I get audit. I get audit the other fellas because they get credit card payments and they get this and they get that and big BC bills and everything, right? Well, that's why. What did we do when we put that in? You don't have to register if you're under hundred thousand dollars, because that's a hard to tax sector. And instead of having that challenge my administration unit, I'm just going to exempt them. Now you can voluntarily come in because you want you want your, your credits and everything else, or you don't have to even be in the tax system. You don't have to register. If you don't register, that relieves me on my administration unit. And we even put in something else. You know, four hundred thousand dollars. You just you forget about credits and offsets. You just pay a flat fee. I think it's like four percent. Right? You don't have to worry about credit, and it, you balance it out on average. It's about like that, right? You pay four percent on your revenue and to that. Don't worry about offsets and credit. Make it easier on the administration unit and the taxpayer. For a smaller taxpayer. So those are some challenges in how you deal with the issues of weak tax administration units. Okay. Game board easy, right? You've got a hundred dollars in play. We tax you as a percentage of your play. Period. End of story. Easy. Right. You've got one hundred and fifty. We give you X plus one percent. Scale it up. Easy. Of course, you know what your play is. Now, 50% of play. <laughs> you still got plenty of money to fight you all, you know. Plenty of money to fight you all. Right? And so the design of the tax policy should be in a way that you make it easier for administration. Again, $100,000 in back, flat rates. Easy, easy, right? Don't put business license people in the in the back unit. They just don't know. They don't. They've never had to have an offset in their in their career of administering business license. Never had to have a deduction. Now you're putting them in a unit where it's all about offsets and deductions. Poor, and you don't train them properly. The administration unit fails. Structures which do not encourage an integrated approach to different taxes. Yep. It's a nightmare. Anybody try opening a business? Mm -hmm. right. No? You'll get a business license. Or you get a business license, you'll go to NIB. Go on NIB, I got to go to, to, to Ministry of Works to inspect this place, right? You got to run around all day for, for weeks because nothing is coordinated. I give my business license application. Business license don't call Ministry of Works. I got to call Ministry of Works, but it's a disaster. Yeah. Opening a business in this country is a disaster. Right? It's frustrating because it's not integrated. Now I have different, you know, tax administration units I have to do. I get that, 
We integrate it. As soon as I do my business license application, they should dispatch this person, dispatch this person, process my NIV application off the business license application so I get an NIV number right away. Right? You make it integrated, then it's not that big a deal. But we're so far from integrations. Right? It's crazy. Crazy. Are they trying to like this, this this single electronic window at custom, right? It's supposed to help integrate all the import elements. I hope it works. What did we try what did we propose? Now that I guess we never did it, but we we both. These guys don't look like they're doing it. It's their fault. But a central revenue authority, right? Remember all the talk about that? I was gonna put real property tax, you know, um, inland revenue, um, Customs, right? Everybody I had to touch, I was going to put under a central revenue authority. And therefore, I'm integrating everything. Right, don't, don't ask me why I don't ask. My good friend Michael Halpius, I told him that that's that. The downfall is that his legacy. Right. Imbalance their service and enforcement functions. So, if I'm only going to enforce tax on certain groups but not other groups, right? it creates bad administration. So we know this poor governance and corruption entrenched long time. Long time. Right? How long have you been in the game of work? Thirteen years. Thirteen years. <laughs> Bloody <laughs> Plenty changes in, in game. You were always on the collection enforcement side? No, I was in investigation. Most of them, back then, it was only on the casino side. Yes. They didn't have the criminal side. You must have seen plenty. Yeah. Then casinos would like to hire you. Right. We talked about. So, this is what we need to have an effective administration. Effective tax administration consistent with the tax policy is not easy to accomplish. Especially if we're changing tax policy, being able to change the administrative unit, we use this, putting business license people in inland revenue for that administration. Right? So that's not easy to accomplish. In order to address these weaknesses over time, you have to have tremendous political will. Which is hard. Hard. Because you get beat up all the time. Rupert Roberts on you every single day. Right? And you change in your tax policy now because of your, polit your, your, your politics. Is it? BLB did it, FNM did it. Rupert is a powerful man. Powerful man. Right? You come in and you got the big hotels lobbying for one thing. They get these tax breaks, but you don't extend it to everything else. It creates a weak administration unit. I see it now. Yeah, again, I represent the one out west, right? We have certain concessions that other, other hotels don't have when we negotiated the deal. Right? So I see it. They try, to, they try to enforce it along this way. When they would have read our heads of agreement, they would have known that's not the right way. But it's inconsistent. It's not their fault. They weren't, they weren't properly prepared. And, 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 but that's what we do in this country. We give concessions. We give special favors here, and this and that, and then we expect the tax people to properly administer. Right? So you need strong political will to resist some of those anomalies to ensure that you have a good tax administration. Right? You need strong leadership at the administration, administration level. You need people that have been there 13 years. Right? They, they, they know how to administer the gaming board, for example. You move people in and out, in and out, you don't have strong leadership. Without strong leadership, the entire administration unit is weak. Right? You have to have a sustained commitment to eliminate corruption. Right? I, 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 shouldn't, I shouldn't have to go 
I go from a customs office that I've known for so long, you know, my 90s cousin, sweetheart, right? And I go to I shouldn't have to get a work permit processed by buying and paying for lunch money. Corruption is endemic in our system. And, and I'm not talking about corruption at the, at the, at the political level. Right? All of the administration units of this country have corruption endemic in them. And I'm not saying everybody is corrupt. But I'm saying the, the, the bureaucracy itself. Right? The, I'll give you an example. We were trying to put in um, the, the electronic incorporation of the registrar, right? Especially y'all in the offshore world know about this. Where now you can file companies online. You don't have to go down and file online. You know the resistance that we got for putting that in place? You know why? Ain't no lunch money. Ain't no lunch money. You, you, you screw up your face. That's absolutely the case. But what they do now is when you go to pick them up, they, they figure out another way to get lunch money. They try to go around to yeah, all yeah, the others, they get They have to find their way. AG at the time is Allison Maynard Gibson. You know how he shows you? She's a hard woman, boy. She pushed her things right through. So they had to, they had to accept it. So you got to find another way. They turn you around and collect I, 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 um, when I was the Minister of Financial Services, I had a, I had an agreed arrangement at Cabinet and the Minister of Immigration, Fred. Right? What we were going to do, we were going to have an economic unit of immigration for permanent residencies, for work permits related to business, and especially in financial services. We were going to set up our own office, right? staff it, and split it on the budget. I was going to put financial officers in, he's going to put customs officers in, boardroom, make it. Make it proper and efficient, different color paper, and all of this mm -hmm. stuff, right? To try to streamline it. You think I know that went anywhere? Mm -hmm. I had the agreement of the Prime Minister and the Cabinet of the Bahamas. Mm -hmm. Director killed it. No lunch money. <laughs> <laughs> you, th you think I'm joking? <laughs> the most lunch money comes from the financial services industry because they want their things quick. No question. Now, that, now, I ain't saying the banks pay. They get paid. Right? <laughs> Didn't happen, right? So, and, and, and the will wasn't there to eliminate the corruption. Why? Because I think we have to start firing everybody. Firing directors, firing this and firing that. We ain't going to fire the director of immigration. Right? Deputy director. Whoever was causing the disruption. So the whole efficient administration of a, of a government unit and I call immigration tax unit, right? Big revenues coming to immigration because of corruption. Right? You think we got, we got a problem in the country? Of course we do. Endemic. Endemic. And that's why our ease of doing business is at the bottom. I just keep coming up. I keep going backwards. So, read that and tell me if that sounds familiar. It's the backdrop of relatively weak institutional capacity and a poor culture of tax compliance. Most developing countries face a long struggle to improve revenue performance in an efficient and. We're going to be going before the end there. I don't, I can't teach more. I can teach, but I can't teach more. And this is the first day. You turn it up or you turn it right? Right. 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 No, boy, listen, I am a conquer man. You want to make sure you wash it with fresh water and scrub it, right? Scrub all that slime off the jug. You don't do it, you make it, you don't wash it. You got enough breath on that fresh water and you taste it. <laughs> they diet Kong, they eat Kong, they clean Kong, they do everything with Kong. Right? And today is the first day of what? Okay. Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> college football season. Oh, oh geez. Geez. Uh, okay. so, okay. Right? Okay. Who's your team? Well, I go with Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> We'll wait 
for NFL. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, uh, yeah, next weekend. Yeah. No, I'm not teaching next weekend, so you may go into trusts or, or something. <laughs> Why am I not teaching next weekend? What is next weekend? The home opener for the Miami Dolphins! Good fight. What happened, Delta? Good fight. That's a fanatic. It is. What happened? 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 What Come back. I'll do the second class here, and then we go straight into international. So you will have me for like three weeks. In a row. Okay. So four major major drivers of an, um, the performance of a tax administration. Right. Proactive demand management. That's just a, a management of, of, of the unit. A sophisticated taxpayer segment. Right. And for instance, the, uh, the casinos that that. that Gaming board and forces are sophisticated segment. They have entire divisions that are responsible for being able to comply with the tax revenue, right? Streamline ob obligations and performance tracking. Right? I don't know if they do this in the gaming board. I suspect they don't do it in the land revenue. But internal performance tracking. How are you as an enforcement agent? And are you getting complaints? Are you are you processing these things timely? Or, you know, do you have a good compliance rate? You know? So you have to have internal performance as well, right? Proactive divine management. You don't need all of this information if you're not going to use it. Then you get, you know, crowded in, into this, right? I'll, I'll give you an example. This, this, this can happen anywhere. But we, we, um, I was the minister that put in FATCA, right? I put in FATCA. I did the negotiation, the IGA, and everything else, right? And that's automatic exchange of information. That's with the U.S. We have CRS. So I said, we're going to do, did I do the CRS yes, day? Yes, day. Yeah, you all been violent. Yeah. Well, yesterday was a rough one day. I had to on conference calls and writing memos and opinions all day. Oh, it was one So I made the decision, or we made the decision, but I made the recommendation that we should be non-reciprocal, meaning we only send information, we don't receive information. Why don't we receive information? Because we don't have an income tax and can't do nothing with it. So why should we be collecting information that has no use? It's just going to clog up the administration unit, right? Somebody got to store it. Somebody got to manage it. Somebody got to do that, right? Right? Complete your task the right way the first time. Easy, easy said, right? Not easy done, right? And maximize your value. These are easy elements to make an administration unit more effective. Right? Segment your taxpayers. I tried this in back, you know, hundred thousand below, you don't have to register four hundred thousand below, you only pay four percent flat. You know, more sophisticated, you know, you, you pay you, we, we, we make you pay on different intervals depending on how much you do business. And so we try to segment it. And I think from, from a filing point of view that has worked. Right? I think the big businesses have it, have the resources to comply monthly. Right? And and I think that there has been that segmented approach has been good from, from a compliance point of view. Right? Individuals versus business taxpayers. Um, that's mostly on the in on the um, income tax side. You make your individuals a more streamlined approach to income tax compliance. Businesses are a little bit more complex, but they're segmented. Right? I don't know if they do that in, in gaming, especially casino games. Because Bimini would have the same obligations as Bahamar, right? I mean, even though they have lower revenues in play. Right. 
Uh, it depends on the square footage. That's right. That's right. Depends on the square footage. So there is a segment in, in gaming. It's segmented by size rather than by revenue, which, which probably corresponds in revenue anyway. Right? The numbers houses aren't segmented except for tax rates. You streamline your operations, you know, you make strategic decisions and investments in technology. We're talking about e-filing and streamlining. You, know, you, have to, you have to have a modern administration unit in today's world, right, to make it more efficient. You know, IT departments and systems within the unit, you know, and, and do you guys have your own IT department? I don't think inland revenue does. I think they have to call DIT for IT purposes, right? Which is a disaster, right? You can't a centralize in this environment. A centralized IT department does not work for the whole government. It just doesn't work. Yeah, they still doing that. Yeah. Wow. They still doing that. If I sit in the Ministry of Financial Services and I have some IT problem, that's just the ministry. Imagine immigration. You gotta get DIT there. Inland revenue, you gotta get DIT there. Customs, you gotta get DIT there. And performance tracking. I need to know how well your your portfolio of gaming houses that you're doing are complying. Gotta have some performance tracking. You were enforcement, right? You said? Well, I mean, investigations. Well, enforcement. Enforcement, investigations, enforcement. Right? So, examinations are part of the enforcement unit of a tax administration unit. Audits, right? Calculations, finding non filers, finding deficiencies. You know, when my clients come to me and they've been given their bad assessment, that's the enforcement unit that will come on the ground and done a full audit and then said, we found this and gave them an assessment. And I got it. A client, they spent a year and a half auditing this guy, this company. A year and a half. Gave an assessment that was wrong. Put it in the mail, and then said we had 30 days from when they mailed to receive it. We didn't receive it. We didn't receive it. I said, oh, 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 one, you know they represented by counsel. You got my email. Boy, I I Storm down to come, I could boy. Storm down. Anyway, I had the assessment with us. But you know, your examination is important, but the way you conduct your examination is also important in order to have an administrative unit. The vast majority of my clients are fine paying what's there. Right? They ain't crooks. They're big companies. They can't be crooks. But they don't like paying what's not fair, and they don't like being gone through the ringer for no reason. The same one, they gave an assessment, like $2 million assessment. Right? And my client is zero rated. They're in the international shipping business. They're zero rated. Inland revenue couldn't figure out what they're doing, so they assessed them standard rate on everything. Right? You spent a year in this place. And you still can't figure out, so you assess some standard rate on the whole thing. Right? Now we figured out that 14% of the business activity was standard rate, 86% was zero rated. We we took the general ledger down and we highlighted and identified on the general ledger what was standard, what was zero for them. We went through the whole exercise. My client said, you know, yeah, 14% of my business is standard rate. I don't mind paying or not. But I'm zero rate on anything else. We got it reversed and my client was more than willing to accept what we were supposed to be paying. So you need a proper audit system, an audit system and examination unit where the the examiners know what they're doing, and they don't take the easy way out and say, I can't figure this out, so let's just assess everything. And they'll have to come back and prove it to me. That's not how you do an examination. It's not how you do it.
Now we seem to be good at collections, right? You know, we assess you and I want you to pay me right away. Right? But yeah, I mean, collections is important. You know, improved collection performance helps revenue and helps the, the predictability of revenue. So we may not have to have the variances at budget time. Right? And, 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 and our tax collections is, is difficult in that it's seasonal, in, in, especially in the tourism business. And so you, you always hear to come the midterm budget, right? When it's completely out of whack. Oh, no, 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 we expect big collections in the next quarter. Every government says that in the midterm, but it's true. Because you're going into spring break, right? And you're gonna get better collections coming in, right? And slow season starts in the summer, right? July to October, November, and then it starts picking up. And so it is, and so our collections is challenged by that. Um, and it's hard to have, you know, proportionality and revenue when, when you depend on seasonal industries. So, I mean, it's, I think we do okay. Okay, that's it. Any questions about today's class? Like I said, the, the, the module here is kind of just to introduce you to tax policy, tax administration, how taxes are brought into effect, how they affect people, and then we dive into the technical. You know, trust taxation is a difficult module. People always have a tough time with tax, tax taxation. Uh, trust taxation. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mm -hmm. <laughs> International is is very hefty and meaty. I mean, there's a lot, a lot there. Um, but it's from a compliance point of view, it's Clearly, we have offshore bankers in the room. Really important. Really, really important. Um, I also teach the review session at the end. Right? And I think they give you, um, I try to tell them, and I, sometimes I do two review sessions. I do a review session, and I think they give you a mock exam. I think. Um, and then I teach after the mock to hit any of the questions that people have a, a, a significant difficulty with. Um, and we go over. Um, there are some calculations when we get into the deep meeting stuff. Um, and in the beginning, I was doing a lot of that in my review session, but I think people are more familiar with that and that calculations and everything else. And so a lot of it's in the, you know, certainly the international spots and, and trust taxation, trust taxation. I don't teach more than two hours. I generally don't teach. Okay, we're good. I will give you my email in case you need it. Mark Pinder. My handwriting is not good. I'm a typical lawyer. R Pinder, right? At gmail.com. You can have my cell, but don't call, text. I hate answering phone calls. But you can text WhatsApp me if you want, if you need any have any questions. Okay? <laughs> See you guys in three weeks. I'll find out from Miguel. Let me ask Miguel.
to write. Okay? So same time, same place next week. Okay? So we'll be good to go. Everybody sign my register? Sure. Okay, great. Thanks. <coughs> Alright, and then this week I'll have I'll call you all this week the for the rest of your stuff. You possibly want to say. Definitely. Thanks. Okay guys. Alright? Thank you. Okay. Go Go dolphins. Go dolphins. Go dolphins. Yeah, I'm sorry, we can get the bar.